Hey, boys and girls, and welcome to another episode of the Breaking Muscle Podcast, where we bring you conversations with the thought leaders who are working to change America's fitness culture. I am Pete Hitzeman, your host today and managing editor at BreakingMuscle.com. If the statistics surrounding the obesity crisis weren't scary enough already, all indications are that our kids are going to fare even worse than us. Ubiquitous technology and a society that has long neglected and forgotten the needs of the body have created the unhealthiest generation in American history. One of the greatest challenges we face as a nation in turning the tide is getting kids active, and we're losing that battle as well. Kids are leaving youth sports in droves, and it isn't just because they'd rather play games on their phones. John O'Sullivan founded the Changing the Game Project after he discovered that the main reason kids stop playing is that we adults ruin the fun. He sat down with me to discuss how we need to create a national movement toward physical literacy as a crucial life skill. We cover the obvious positive health and academic results from a robust physical education program, and how we should create a system that encourages the transition from team sports in school to individual athletic pursuits as an adult. John also weighs in on the role the NCAA should take in deprofessionalizing youth sports, the risks and benefits of elite youth sports leagues for kids and families, and strategies to raise the level of coaching for all youth sports. He contends that if we wish to meet the physical needs imposed by our modern lifestyle, we have to start by shifting our emphasis from business interests to the kids' best interests. If you like what you hear every week on the Breaking Muscle podcast, do us a favor and help us get the word out. Share your favorite episodes with your friends and head over to iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play Music to leave, leave us a rating or a review. And if you have any comments or questions for the show, we'd love to hear them at editorial at breakingmuscle.com. Joining us today on the Breaking Muscle podcast is John O'Sullivan. He is the founder and CEO of the Changing the Game Project, whose aim is to rescue youth sports from itself. John, thank you so much for, for sitting down with us today. Oh, thank you guys for having me on. I appreciate it. So what uh, what's wrong with youth athletics? Why does it need saved? Well, I, I mean, I think what the kids are telling us, if three-quarters of them are quitting, that maybe it's not exactly serving their needs, values, and priorities. I think we have a couple other things for, you know, I'm 45 years old, so if I think about my own life growing up in New York and all the sports I played and the amount of free play, right, whether it was pond hockey or a couple of us playing baseball or, you know, flag or, you know, usually tackle football together, you know, just the, this idea that sports has become highly specialized, the competitive angle of it has been pushed younger and younger and younger, and uh, it's not necessarily, you know, so, so because of those things, right, we have, you know, a lot of costs involved as well that we didn't have at the grassroots level, and, you know, as a result, you know, a lot of families can't even get in, and then a lot of kids are getting out early. And the statistics on the kids that are getting out early are are damning. Like you said, the the seventy percent or seventy five percent quit rate. Youth sports participation on the whole is is in decline numerically as well as as, as a in terms of percentage, and that has a ripple effect out and out in a lot of different areas that that I kind of want to touch on today. Yeah. Why? Let let me start with the fifty thousand foot view. Why do we want more kids in youth athletics? Well, I mean, let's just start from a, a health of the nation standpoint. You know, I, I think right now uh, the CDC says that if children participated in an hour of activity a day over the course of the next, you know, 20 years, it would reduce health care costs in this country by trillions of dollars. So let's start right there with the fact that we have an unsustainable health system. And even if we turn around and give everyone insurance, we can't pay for it, right? So you know, and, and eating better and being more active are two key components in the overall health of the nation. So, you know, number one, there, there's a thing to start. Number two, what we know from statistics is that today's 10-year-old children, and you can go to designtomove.org to get more on this, today's 10-year-old children have a five-year shorter life expectancy than their parents do due to inactivity, right? And what we know is that children who are active at what we call adolescence, so 10, 11, 12 years old, 
they're they're very likely to be active throughout their whole life. One tenth the obesity rate. They do better in school. Lower health care costs. They make more money. They're more likely to go to college, and they're very likely to raise active children themselves. Whereas kids who are not active at that age, it's very hard to break the cycle later. So right at this age where we have children dropping out of sports, we also have you know schools that are cutting physical education. We're cutting recess time and, and making kids sit in their seats longer, even though all the evidence shows that that actually doesn't improve educational outcomes. It hurts them. So we have a whole entire system that's not based on best science and best practices. In many cases, it's based on, oh, well, this is the way we've always done it. And so and we've built up all these you know systems and processes around maintaining the status quo instead of uh, doing what we know is right. And the, is that a good answer for you? That's a solid. <laughs> that's a very solid answer. Uh, it's almost like you've given it before. Uh, the, <laughs> the the union of youth athletics and education is a sticky one, right? Because school systems are struggling monetarily, and so for them to put money into youth sports, it gets kind of narrower and narrower, and it goes into those sports that people tend to appreciate from an entertainment perspective more, while physical education classes are getting cut out. And that's something that, you know, Shane Trotter, who writes for us, has has complained about at length, is that we want kids to play competitive sports, but they have no physical literacy upon which to, to build those skills. So, how do we how do we solve that dilemma with with uh, you know increasingly limited budgets and kids who need more physical health? Well, I think first of all, you know, we we have to take this word physical literacy and we have to make it a, a national buzzword so that everyone understands this, right? So, uh, the example I always use in my talks is. If you had a six-year-old who was struggling with reading, you wouldn't just say, ah, she's not a reader. Mm. Let's forget about reading. We say reading, that's a life skill. Like this is going to be really important for the rest of her life. So we need to intervene. But we take six-year-olds who struggle in sport and we say, ah, they're just not an athlete. Forget about it, right? And And so we have to really have a national movement to understand that sports skills like running and jumping and skipping and hopping and catching and throwing and tracking these are you know important life skills that can be taught when we intervene and i think we miss out on these early intervention ages you know where i live the school district you know and i have a 10 and 11 year old and they're very active because, you know, myself and my wife were college athletes and they're involved in sports and we do lots of camping and biking and all and skiing and all these things together. Um, but, you know, they had PE one day a week in elementary school, right? Sometimes wow. two. And now, you know, now my daughter's in middle school and she gets PE five days a week, which I think is great. But what about all the kids who have already in their minds are like, I, I'm just, I hate PE because I'm embarrassed because I can't do these things. When they were five and six years old, we should have been teaching them how to run and how to jump and, and, and developing these individual sports skills. And I think, I mean, with this day and age and technology, these type of things can be happening in classrooms. We can be taking brain breaks and, and teaching kids, you know, they all go up to the front of the room and let's do some lunges and let's work on stability and, and things like this. You know, this should be an integrated part of the curriculum. You know, I, I worked with a guy named Paul Zintarski. Uh, I helped him do his TED Talk. He's from a school district in Illinois called Naperville. And if you've ever read the book Spark, or you know by John Rady, or there's actually a PBS documentary uh, in Naperville. They revamp their PE program to create a much more individualized program. So they realize that most people, you know, most people after high school participate in individual sports: running, cycling, swimming, things like that. So why are we teaching only team sports in school PE? Why don't we teach people? you know, how to use a heart rate monitor and how to do things that, you know, they can do the rest of their life in sport the way that they're going to pursue it. And they started having great effectiveness with this. Their obesity rates in their district went way down. And then what they did was they had a second intervention 
and they um, they put the kids who were struggling the most in school. They started a program called Learning Readiness PE, and they gave them PE right before their you know remedial math class or their remedial English class, and then they measured the results. And what they found was that children who did PE right before their intervention in a subject they were struggling in performed three to ten times better than kids who didn't. So they have three twenty times. massive difference in performance just by doing exercise before they went to this class. Right? That's and not just have, statistically relevant, that's a landslide. It's a landslide, right? And this is one of the highest performing school districts in the nation. Wow. And yet no one knows about this. All right, and they've got all the the data that show that there's no other intervention for these kids except PE right before it, and you know, and they do brain breaks in class, and it's made a massive, massive difference. So we have to take programs that are working and say, how can we apply these to other places? And, and this is what I'm talking about when we've just built a, up a system that supports the system and not the kids. You touched on something there that I think is crucial, which is that the sport and athletic landscape is changing. There's become a dichotomy between your athletic activity in youth and your athletic, your, your future athletic activity as an adult, where we play team sports as kids and then we watch team sports as adults. And the problem is that we don't pick anything else up. And that's kind of why you know our adult populations have the health problems. I think one of the reasons why the adult populations have the health problems that they have is because once you're done playing football in high school, there's no place to go play football and face it, you know, with CTE and everything else, maybe you shouldn't keep playing football. But there isn't then uh, an avenue for most people to automatically shift to. And one of the things, we just did an episode with a guy named Ben Rollenhagen, who is a, he works with the Specialized Foundation, and they're introducing a cycling physical education curriculum into school districts. They've written a whole thing, and they provide bikes, and they partner with local cycling shops and all this things. And one of the things that's really interesting about that is it provides a fitness outlet that, that people can use for their entire lives. And there's not really an age where you can't ride a bicycle. So do you think that part of rescuing youth health is going to involve abandoning some team sports or at least de-emphasizing them? Um, I don't know. I, I hope not because I think, you know, different people gravitate to different sports for, for very good reasons. Um, I, I just I, – I forget the guy's name. I was just – presenting for the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Assembly, and uh, this guy got an award who has done incredible work in luge, right, and, 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 and you know, just like street luge and, and how the, we get people into this sport, and I think, you know, what, one of the things they were talking about there is there are so many sports that you grow up in a team sport, and maybe you're not going to make it there, but those skills are transferable to a whole slew of other sports that maybe you never considered, right? Your chances of making it, for, you know, from high school basketball to the NBA are like 0.001%, but the amount of people who do fencing who then are Olympic fencers is pretty high, right? Because, you know, or luge or whatever. And this guy told a story how he, you know, he saw luge in the Olympics. He said, I want to try that. He went to a camp at Lake Placid, two weeks, learned how to do luge, and three weeks later, they called him and said, we're taking you to the world championships, right? And, and you know, he's 50 now. And there's obviously more people doing stuff like that. I don't know that that happens today. But he was like, all of a sudden, I was a national team loser, you know, but I had done all this other stuff growing up that prepared me for that moment. And so I, I hope not, but I do think within team sports with young kids, we need to teach multi-movement, not just sports, right? Not just layer on sports-specific skills on these castles built in sand where the kids are not athletic enough and, and we don't teach that. And then, it, you know, I, I think the tumblings, the parkours, the, more, the rock climbings, the more creative we communities can be about introducing these type of sports, I, I think... Those are the sports that people will will stick with later on as well. And there's going to have to be a certain uh, embracing of risk as well, right? Within the bounds of well-understood team sports, everybody feels like they know what they're doing and it's very safe. If you want to take a bunch of kids rock climbing, 
good luck getting the parental releases signed for that one, man. Like, everybody's scared Johnny's going to fall off and break his neck even if he's on a tether. Right, and it, and it's I mean, and we're getting better at that. You know, I certainly live in a very outdoorsy community, and there's an amazing rock gym here, and it's incredible. And I love taking my my kids there, and they yeah, they scare me, but I'm you know I, I have to have a little faith. I mean, we can't, you know, sports is never going to be in a bubble, right? You cannot ever legislate or remove all risk from sport. Um, but I think you can be smart about, you know the type of risks that we allow, right? This is why hockey said, hey, do we really need body checking 12 and under? No, it's not producing better hockey players. It's just producing more injuries. So whether it's football deciding about is there ages that we're going to remove tackling or soccer removing heading, I think we can look at the science and say, hey, there's some things that really don't have to be involved in the game at this point in order to make the game safer for kids, but we can never r- remove all, all risk, nor nor should we. Yeah, well, I mean, growth comes from acceptance of risk in a lot of respects. So let's touch on, on the foundations of the problem and then kind of work our way up. You've done a lot of work into finding out why kids are leaving youth sports, and you kind of have to ask the kids, right? You can't just look at the system. What are the kids saying? Well... You know, some of the best research um, is research done by a woman named Amanda Visick out of George Washington University. And it's very recent, done in 2014. And uh, she calls it the fun integration studies and the fun maps. And, you know, so she asks kids, you know, why do you play? And this this specific group is 12 and under um, because it's fun. Right, ninety percent. That's the number one answer. So she said, "Well, let's define fun." And kids came up with eighty-one characteristics of fun. Um, you know, positive team dynamics, coaches who respect and encourage me, uh, being pushed, the excitement of competition, pushed in terms of like you know, organized coaches who had good practices and things like that. Um, getting to play, being with my friends. This makes it fun, right? You know, focusing on winning number 48 on the list, mm. right? Taking team pictures, 81 on the list, right? So that's dead last, right? <laughs> um, and, and, you know, and then she has some new research coming out of what makes sports not fun, and kids came up with actually 91 things, I think, that make it not fun, and two-thirds of those have to do with the adults, right? You know, the coaches and the parents. So criticism and yelling, fear of making mistakes, not getting playing time, these are the things that make it not fun. And and I think, you know, we have to not we're, – we're pretty good right now because there's a lot of research out there of asking kids what they want, but we're not very good at implementing it, right? We say, ah, well, you know, that's it. And, and I think it starts with this idea that the kid's game is supposed to look like the game we see on Sunday or the game we see on ESPN. And it's not – and nor should it. We have great patience in, you know, we don't expect our first year piano player to, you know, play Tchaikovsky with both hands in a full octave, but we expect six-year-old soccer kids not to bunch up. It's not going to (laughs) happen. No, it is not going to happen. And that, that brings me to another one of the points that I've always wondered about. Now I don't have kids and I don't coach kids generally, although occasionally when I sit on the sidelines of my of my neighbor's kids' Pee Wee football game. I'm the kids are fun to watch because they're hilarious, but the parents are almost horrifying because they're watching this game like they would watch an NFL game. They're cheering the same, they're using the same expletives. They're they're almost using their kids as a surrogate football team that they get to run. It's the strangest, most corrupt form of fantasy football almost, if you want to, if you want to term it that way. I, it is. And you know, I have people who send me like the craziest stories through our work at Change in the Game Project. And um I just got one the other day. Some guy sent me like a, a link to the youth football forums, and I think it was in like Georgia or something like that. And this guy somewhere in there had ranked all the uh, eight and under players, right? Like these are the top 20 players, you know, number whatever from this team and number whatever for this team. And the parents are going back and forth on, oh, yeah, this kid. And the guy gets in, he's like, I've watched film of every game three times to come up with this list. And I'm like, what is wrong with you? 
<laughs> you have serious problems, but this is real, and this is happening in lots of places, as as Friday Night Tykes demonstrates, sadly. And these are people who, I, I mean, I really think they have problems. Um, you know, you should not be that into your kid's football game. When the game's over, your kid's over it, you need to move on, too. Well, and frankly, after you watch any game at any level, you should probably be over it pretty quickly after the game is over. Because the kids are. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you, that's just a healthy adaptation to anything. Like, you just shouldn't obsess over anything that's not life-threatening for that long. Exactly. Just, just amazing. But part of the thing that's driving that, okay, so there's this weirdo out there who's watching hundreds of hours of film of eight-year-olds playing, which is bizarre, but but it's not that far off of colleges recruiting all the way back into 7th and 8th grade now. Is there a role for the NCAA to play here in deprofessionalizing uh, kids' sports? You're asking the NCAA to actually advocate for athletes? Wow. wow. <laughs> now that's a huge thing because that would be totally against what they've done for years. Mm. Um, uh, you know, I don't do any work with the NCA. So I'm not, worried about <laughs> not anymore. <laughs> not anymore. I, I mean, this is, you know, I mean, this is the thing. So, you know, actually in lacrosse just this year, like three, four years ago, all the men's and women's lacrosse coaches, like a 90% approval rate said, NCA, please help us to help ourselves, right? We cannot be watching middle schoolers play lacrosse and getting verbal commitments. But I can't be the first coach to stop because then I lose a competitive advantage. We need you to step in and say, you know, this needs to happen. And it took like three or four years for the NCAA this past April to finally pass a thing where there is no contact, no emails, phone calls, verbal commitments prior to a kid's junior year, right? And, and again, this was where all the coaches said, you, we want you to do this. This wasn't the coaches fighting this thing. They were begging for it, and it still took years. And I'm hoping that other sports will follow because, again, when recruiting pushes younger, it pushes the travel and the competitiveness and the cuts and everything you know, far too young, right? If my 14-year-old is getting watched, well, we better start winning tournaments at 12, which means we better, you know, make cuts at 9, which means we better get these kids committed year-round at 8, and, and it trickles down. And so I think the NCA should have a, a massive role that, A, we don't want any verbal commitments, which are the most ridiculous thing anyway because they mean nothing, right? A kid could break them and a coach could break them. You know, I think it's more of an ego thing. So, A, there shouldn't be verbal commitments. Um, B, I mean, as we're seeing now, well, finally the FBI intervened in, in basketball, right? There's so much, you know, scandal out there. C, you take sports like soccer where, at least on the Division I men's side, most coaches support a split season where they have a fall and a spring, um, because right now they have kids playing two or three games in seven days, which from a sports science standpoint is terrible, Yeah. right? So so for an athlete health perspective, playing one game a week is better. Hmm. But again, the NCA won't act upon this stuff, right? And then they say, oh, well, you don't, you know, you're a money-losing sport. Well, you know, if you keep making us play Tuesday at 4 p.m., of course no one's going to come to the game, right? But if we get to play on Saturdays, you know, there's programs that are, drawing six, eight, ten thousand 10,000 fans a game to soccer games now, hmm. like, let's give them the chance to do that. You know, let's play our championship in May in nice weather instead of December in the snow. So, you know, yes, the NCA can have a massive impact if they actually were more concerned about athlete welfare and less concerned about making money. Well, and the money problem is the elephant in the room, right? The The biggest, dirtiest problem with the NCAA, and I say this while I'm wearing an Ohio State football hoodie, so full disclosure, I'm a fan of the system that has the problem, but these are programs that are professional sports programs, and whether or not you think collegiate athletes should be paid, a professional sports program is required to compete at a professional level, and so the coaches, it's this arms race, right? And the only people who can step in to stop this arms race is the NCAA itself. So you, if you have a coach that's making $4 million and he wants to become the coach that makes $10 million, and this is 
purely restricted to football because no other sport gets overcompensated. Well, maybe basketball. Then you have to you have to maintain your competitive edge, or you're going to get fired, or you know whatever. If if you don't recruit early enough and often enough and aggressively enough, and you don't get the kids in that have the talent that you need to create a winning program, you know you're out on the street. So, is is there a point where someone has to say enough is enough and and separate semi-professional athletics from higher education? Yeah, I mean, man, I mean, that's a whole podcast right there on, on that <laughs> one question, right? So, sure. you know, to give to just, you know, touch on it, it's pretty clear what we do now doesn't really work, and it's this consistent policing of whatever. You know, I've always felt this, you know, and, and I've had athletes that I've coached who, you know, have not chosen certain schools because coaches even in, you know, non-revenue sports are like, well, you can't major in education because you're not allowed to do student teaching because you'd miss spring practice or something like that, right? So we have athletes pursuing degrees that fit their sports schedule but not what maybe their interests might be. And I think that's a really sad thing. And I, And what I wish schools would do is, hey, is there a way to give – student athletes a reduced schedule of some basic stuff and then you know or hey in a big time football or basketball program you know hey we, because you did this for us we'll, you know we'll give you 120 free credits to use later on when you're done playing and actually get a degree that you might care about because you realize that you're not going to make a living as an athlete mm -hmm. um, I, I feel like you know schools could do more on that front rather than oh, squeeze in as many classes as you can here um, in a subject that you don't really care about because that will allow you to continue playing football or basketball or whatever. Yeah, take a full-time course load and train like it's literally your job. You know, and I did. To that. Hours I, mean, I, yeah. I took a full-time course load and, and, and played a Division One college sport, and it's really hard, and – you know, I've coached college sports, and I've seen how hard it is for the kids. But again, you know, I was coaching soccer. The you know the travel, the commitments are, are not as much, you know, on the athletes as basketball and football are. So I, I do have empathy for those athletes of trying to balance thirty plus hours a week of a sport in school, um, especially if they're trying to pursue a major that they really care about and it just this class schedule doesn't fit the sports schedule yeah I, I want to rewind a little bit and, and talk about uh, those those adolescent athletes you mentioned that were were layering sports skills on top of the the foundation of sand that you were talking about so the thing that's missing is the basic physical literacy that's developed from say birth to 10 or birth to eight depending on whose whose study you've read where did that break down why aren't kids coming into those junior sports programs already with those built-in skills? Well, I mean, I think there's a number of reasons. Number one, just kids don't go out in the street and play anymore, right? So we've we've lost this free play culture. You know, when I was growing up, it was like you'd get home from school and you'd go out and play with your friends and you had to be home by dark and the neighborhood looked after everyone. And one day we were, you know, at the construction site playing with nails and the next time we were at the pond playing pickup hockey and whatever. And, you know, our parents just trusted that, you know, if they didn't know where we were, they could make three or four phone calls and someone would know where they were. Right. So maybe this has changed because maybe now more families have two parent incomes. And so there's not someone there. So it's easier to put them in something organized. You know, we, we've mitigated risk in I mean, remember what, playgrounds used to look like 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 those are like some fun like when you go to like a city that has like an old playground still you're like yes i remember that versus now where everything's rubber and safe and friendly and cooperative and so you know kids don't fall out of trees anymore right we used to learn how to fall and roll out of it when you had a much lower center of gravity i think these things all play into it uh as well and then again when you just don't go from, you know, when I was growing up, I'd play like soccer in the fall and then I did wrestling and then I usually play some basketball or at least pick up basketball with friends. And I played baseball and I think in middle school, I learned to play golf and 
<clears throat> you know, I played, like I said, I played pond hockey. So I did all these different sports. They all teach you to move differently and fall differently and um, jump differently. And I think that just develops this all around uh, athleticism. But I think now from a sports science perspective, we know better ways to intervene, right? We know better ways to teach. And so it can be this combination of multi-sport, but also teaching multi-movement earlier. You know, let's teach kids how to run. Like where, where, where are your arms supposed to go? You know, where do your feet go, right? When you jump, how do you, you know, where do your knees go? Like these are interventions that aren't super hard to make, in my opinion. They're super hard to make, but the first thing is we have to recognize the need to make them. And, and like you well, said, I think, yeah. I think we've been very slow to react to the effect of our societal and cultural changes on our kids, right? So it's, it's not just that parents are more risk-averse now than they used to be, although they are, and nonsensically, because every study shows that we're a safer society now than we've ever been. Mm -hmm. And it's not just that kids are lazy, because kids are what we make them, but there is so much more technology now than there was when, when you and I were kids. And, and it's a lot more accessible and it's a lot more ubiquitous. And so there's a lot of, um, there's a lot more reasons to sit down. There's a lot more reasons to stay inside than there ever were before. And they're much more engaging. And it, it we went from a point where it was unusual for a family to have more than one TV in the house when I was a kid to now it's unusual if every kid in the house doesn't have an iPad of their own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's this. It's a sea change in technology and in culture, and we haven't adapted to that reality in terms of our early childhood development to say, okay, we need to go back to basics and teach kids how to run, jump, throw, climb um, before we can worry about sport-specific skills. It's regrettable, but this is a reality we have to accept and address. Um, you know, well, yeah, and I mean, I have a friend, you know, who says, when will what we know change what we do, right? Yes. And, I, and I, I, that really resonates with me, and, you know, I just as the parent of a 10 and 11 year old who, who don't have their own phones, you know, and they're getting close to being about their only, you know, group of their friends who doesn't. And, you know, they have iPads cause their school gives them to them. But, you know, when they come home, it's go outside, run around, play with your friends, it, you know, minimal screen time at home. And, and guess what? They're they're you know, they figure out stuff to do. I mean, you know, God forbid. So, um, you know, when we, when we have that, I think, yeah, I just read this study. There was just two research pieces came out recently about, you know, the direct correlation between rising dep rates of depression and number of hours spent on social media in kids. Yeah. Right? And then you read the Time Magazine article about, you know, some 10-year-old baseball kid who has uh, 30,000 Instagram followers. And it's just like, I mean, come on. You know, get your kids off there. Like, if you read the stuff, why would you do it? <laughs> Yeah, the, the gap between what we know and what we do is, is kind of the fundamental uh, human quandary across the it board, is. isn't it? it but is. I, I think one of the things, that one of the strategies that hasn't been employed yet is that physical literacy and fitness is the new competitive advantage in life. Mm -hmm. I'm in a place professionally now specifically because I'm physically literate, right? I'm now making money off the fact that I can do things physically that other people can't. And mm -hmm. that's the only edge left. That is the last the last great frontier in in human competition almost because you know, everybody's talked about ad nauseum how a bachelor's degree doesn't mean anything anymore. And a master's degree is now required for these like entry level thirty thousand dollars a year positions and then you're gonna take on these tens of thousands of dollars in debt. But if you're fit and can stay awake and alert and on your game all the time and you get those intellectual and psychological benefits of, that come from being in shape, dude, that's going to be your leg up in any situation. And I think if... if we you just it, feel better. <laughs> yeah, well, and besides the fact that it doesn't suck to feel good, you know, exactly. if you're looking for a value proposition, it's there. You know, this is going to make you better than your, you know, than your contemporaries. And I think that's maybe an avenue that we in the fitness industry need to pitch a little harder is like, look, if we want to be the best country in the world or if you want to be the best person at your company, get in shape and do the same for your kids. Yeah, and, and just, you know, you, A, as a parent, model it for your kids and, and B, you know, I, I mean, again, it, you wake up in the morning, if you exercise, you feel better the whole day, right? No one ever says like, oh, man. You know, I wish I didn't go for that run this morning. Like, unless you fell or you got hurt, like, 
you know, you just feel better. You know, this goes back to Naperville School District, right? You raise your heart rate, good things happen. And I think, um, you know, from a government level to a state level to a community level, you know, the, the more we can get people moving, the better. And then, and then, you know, one of the things about being more active, when you go and you do exercise, you're less likely to pick up the jelly donut, right? Because you're like, oh, I just worked out. Like, maybe I'll eat well, too. And I think, you know, you can't exercise your way to, to great health. You know, a lot of it really comes from eating well. And um, if you exercise, you're far more likely to eat well. Let's let's get into that family dynamic for a minute. You mentioned parents modeling the right behavior for their kids. How much of that, how much of the disconnect there maybe is a result of the parents having already made that transition of, oh, sports are something kids do, and so they don't play together. Is there a way to, to reignite that? Ooh, I mean, that's a great question. I, you know, I always say, you know, some people don't do them because they think they're not good at them, right? Mm -hmm. But you're 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 your kid's hero, you know. So they don't know what good looks like when they're three. So wrestle with them, or or you know, kick a ball with them. They don't care, you know. Um, you know, as they get older and they know what good looks like, they'll still appreciate the fact that you spent time with them, right? So I, I think that. But again, it's not just it's not about like, well, I still play in the soccer league. It's yeah, I go to yoga. <laughs> right? Hey, I do some push-ups with your kid or whatever it is. Like, hey, there's a pull-up bar. Like, let's do, who can do more pull-ups today? And and I, I think there's lots of ways that we can model good behavior, even if it's just we go for a walk, <laughs> right? That's still getting out and, and, and enjoying the outside and going for a hike, well, you know, whatever it is. I realize some people live in different places where, these things are maybe not as easy to do, so I try not to, you know, judge and say, well, you you can always do this or you can always do that. But yeah, I mean, you know, watch a Tony Horton infomercial, you know, <laughs> do some do some up downs, uh, do something. I, I think the more you model it, your your kids don't expect you to go out and beat them in a run, but if they see you modeling healthy behavior, they're more likely to do it as well. And I see that firsthand in the CrossFit gyms where I've where I've coached is you know parents bring their kids in and the kids like most of the gyms will have like a kids play area the kids never stay in there they're always peeking around the corner they want to see what mom and dad are doing and a lot of times especially the younger kids who haven't been socialized to understand embarrassment yet they're playing along they're doing burpees on the side and mimicking the barbell movements and everything else that carryover is so remarkable that it's undeniable like the thing that you're doing is going to be the thing that your kid wants to do so if you sit on the couch all the time and yell at the tv there's a fair chance that that's what they're going to want to grow up to do exactly or if you go to their games and yell at them at every mistake it's going to be something that they don't want to do mm -hmm. So let's let's stop beating up on parents for a second because Lord well, knows they're good. <laughs> I'm a parent, and I think 99% of them are great, right? Yeah. We, we, you know, and and but I mean, a lot of them are just scared. You know, they don't know sure. what, who can I trust? What's good information? And so they, you know, they they play, you know, keep up with the Joneses a lot, as and and then the programming in a lot of communities goes and only serves you know, the year round specialist or whatever. So yeah, but yeah, no, no, I think parents are great and we have to engage the 99% of great ones instead of just complaining about the 1% of bad ones. Absolutely. And, and that's a perfect segue into my next question, which was to, to talk about the effect of these semi pro kid sports organizations on the families. Like the parents are doing what they think is the right thing with the information they're being given, right? You've got a kid who demonstrates some propensity for some sport. Lacrosse is a great example in our area. It's blown up over the last several years, and these youth travel lacrosse leagues are going insane. But these parents are literally chasing their kids around the country now, 12 months out of the year. And I can't imagine, having never sat at their dinner tables, I can't imagine that that's creating a more positive family dynamic. What What's the cost that you've seen from, from inside that world? Well, I think, you know, it, it can go two ways, right? I, I've seen families who take advantage of that time, right, and, and say, hey, we're going to make this a great family time, 
Um, so we do talk about stuff in the car and, and we do use these trips to maybe do something cultural while we're in Seattle or Chicago or New York or whatever. The, the sad part about that is the amount of kids who can't participate in it because they just don't have the money to travel. You know, even when these clubs give them a scholarship for their fees, you know, hotels and travel cost way more than that. And so you either turn your kid over to another family who will basically support him or her, or they don't go. So, you know, I, I think, you know, and, and then there's the ones who basically don't save any money for college um, in the hopes of getting a scholarship, right? And they invest everything in that, and yet the statistics are pretty clear that the chances of that are very unlikely. Um, while the chances of getting an academic scholarship are pretty good or putting money in a 529, at least there'll be something at the end to help pay for college. Hmm. Um, so, you know, every family has a different dynamic and a different situation, um, and I'm speaking in generalities here. But, you know, and, and kids love to go to the, a, a tournament, you know, and they stay in a hotel, and I don't knock that at all. But you really need your your B team basketball player in Los Angeles who could get 100 games within a 2 hour drive to go to New York to play a game like is that really the best way to spend our time and and money is it really the best way to you know say oh we have to be in this club that you know and spend 8 hours a week in the car driving to and from practice instead of playing in a community club at age 10 you know, those type of things don't seem to be good use of hours for me. Or developing general athletic skills. You know, the thing that, that keeps coming up over and over again in, in case study after case study is that the top tier, even professional athletes, were multi-sport athletes growing up. They developed a general athleticism that may have led them to a particular sport. But let's face it, a lot of them could have been good in a lot of different sports. Kobe Bryant could have been very good at things other than basketball. He, chose he was a soccer player growing up. He was a soccer player. Guess yeah. what? His footwork was really good, and his change of direction was unparalleled. And his court so, awareness. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, so you know, maybe trucking your kid all over the country all year to play one sport isn't even helping them in that sport as much as you think it is. Yeah. Or or keeping them fresh and <clears throat> excited about playing again. You know, I, I had a friend who coach basketball at a, you know, very well-known high school. And, you know, he's like, you know, back in the day, you know, if you lost in the state semifinal, man, it burned forever. But, you know, our kids, we lose, and the next weekend they have an AAU tournament, so they don't even really care. You know, they're just moving on. And so there's no sort of, like, there's not enough meaningful games. <laughs> like, we need less games and and that are more meaningful than just more and more and more and more games. And, and then I think, you know, with the with the tournament culture as well, because, hey, if I'm going to go from Chicago to Dallas to play an event, I'm not just going for a game. So now we're cramming in five games in two days or three days. Well, think about what that does from a player development standpoint we develop slow players because in game one, you're a hundred percent. So the game, the speeds of actions, they're happening as fast as it can go. Game two, you're tired. So now it's a 90% game three, it's 80%. You know, you make the final, it's like who's left standing, right? When I was coaching college, you never stuck around for the tournament finals because it was such a low standard, hmm. right? So now you have, you know, much higher risks of injury, you have people who are playing game at less than optimum speed. Um, and so they're playing more of their games at less than 100% than games they play at 100%. And so you're actually developing bad habits. Isn't that a, a terrible irony? We're trying so hard to make our kids better at sports that they're actually getting worse at sports and getting, getting injured, worse. like you mentioned. There's you know, 13-year-old kids getting Tommy John surgery and... Volleyball players with blown out ACLs and blown, you know, rotator cuffs in high school or earlier. And what do you think they're going to do after that? You know, if a kid gets injured and has a miserable time up to and including their high school career, you think that the other 60 years of their life is going to be healthy and productive? You know, probably not. They're going to start viewing yeah. fitness as a whole as a, as a bad thing, not just team sports. Well, that's exactly it. I mean, what we know statistically is that kids who quit sports – are far more likely to just leave sports forever, right? So it's not like they quit 
soccer and go to running, they just quit. And then, you know, they, they don't come back to anything. And so the, the amount of people who participate in no sports because they quit when young is, is very high. Um, and so, uh, again, it's our focus for young ages should be keeping them active, keeping them in sports. And when maybe they, you know, matriculate out of a team sport because they don't enjoy it as much, can we funnel them into cycling or swimming or running club or ultimate Frisbee? I mean, so many things that are cool and fun to do that at least keeps them moving. One of the, one of the, more difficult problem, maybe the most difficult problem in youth sports and in youth development is the question of professional coaches for youth sports. On the one hand, you have, you know, Jimmy's dad, who's the coach of the softball team or the baseball team, who doesn't really know anything about coaching. He's there because his kid is there and they needed a coach and he might know the rules of baseball and that's kind of about it. On the other hand, you have these businesses that are youth coach leagues that supply professional level coaching, but that comes with its own risk as well because they're a business interest, and so their first interest is obviously their perpetuation as an entity and making money. Is there, how, how do we crack that nut? Like, where is there a balance to strike between making sure the kids are getting coaching that is more helpful than harmful and not turning it into this, this just athlete mill? Well, I think, first of all, and obviously because I you know, spent many years at, as a coach, um, there are plenty of paid coaches out there who are truly professionals. And what I mean by being professional is they act like professionals. They don't coach the same way 20 years in a row, right? They're always getting better. They're lifelong learners. Um, they understand that coaching is about connection. They treat the athletes with respect. Um, they develop not just the athlete, but the person, Right? And I know plenty of those people, and I would pay a lot of money for them to be around my kids. Then I know people who call themselves professional coaches who do exactly the opposite. Maybe they win a lot of games or they say, oh, look at all my kids who got a scholarship. I, they, they couldn't pay me to get anywhere near my kids. Right? And then, you know, and then you know, at the other end of the spectrum, like you said, is you know, do you win the volunteer lottery where maybe Joey's dad was a college athlete and has some coach training – and that's great. And then the you know the next year you get the exact opposite of that. So I think for the organizations that are using volunteer coaches, we have to start training them, right? Not just in first aid, but we have to teach them how to coach, right? We 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 have to ask a little bit more of them, and then we also have to provide resources for the coaches who are more engaged, who want to learn more. Um, and say, oh, you, you really like this, here's 2.0, 3.0, that, that helps out. So I think, you know, we, we have to, just like we ask our volunteer firefighters to get trained so they don't die in the fire, right? We need to ask our volunteer coaches to train because they're being given a tremendous responsibility to work with kids. And then on the business of sport level, like I said, there's plenty of business of sport people who do an amazing job and we need to highlight them and, and seek them out. And then there's others who don't. And so those people who are in the business of sport, I think, have a responsibility to hold their coaches accountable to a much higher standard that goes beyond how much they know about the sport and start understanding kids. Where does that apparatus come from to, to professionalize or educate or continue to educate our coaches? Um, you know, I think it can come bottom up and top down. You know, I, I think different community clubs can just start saying, you know what, we're doing this because this is going to increase retention and uh, the, you know, our net promoter score for our club and our we'll have happier customers. I think go sports governing bodies need to start mandating it. You know, I think an interesting example in the U.S. is, you know, 10 plus years ago, USA Hockey <laughs> mandated coaching certification. They were the first to roll out an athlete development model. They made a lot of harsh changes like, hey, no body checking 12 and under, and we're getting rid of our national championship for 12-year-olds. And they had plenty of emails of people saying, you're ruining the sport. And now today, guess what is one of the only sports that's growing? Hockey, right? <clears throat> and they have a much higher retention rates of kids who go through ADM clubs. 
and they are training their coaches. Is it perfect? No, right? But they're also, now we have, you know, the U.S. is starting to produce some of the best hockey players in the world. Again, we had a, quite a lull there, right? So th this works on a number of levels that I think, you know, they, they looked at what the kids need, time off the ice, let's give it to them. So I, I think we need our top down people to start doing it. And the thing that I always recommend to them is why don't you offer beginning online coach education to your current high school and college level athletes, right? Let's get them started learning how to coach while they're still playing because it makes them a better player. And maybe in a couple of years when they have their own kids and they go out to coach, they're like, you know, I took some coaching courses. They were pretty good. Like there, I learned some stuff there. Let me jump in versus, well, I played a sport, so I know how to coach. And and that that is huge. You know, playing. There are athletes who make fabulous coaches, and there are athletes who it's like, did you ever hear anything your coaches said ever? But if we were offering that opportunity for, you know, current athletes who already have a passion for the sport, by and large, will have a passion for the sport to learn then how to coach it. I think that's a that could be a huge step forward. And the quality just, of our coaching you know, nationwide. This is how you give back, right? Yeah. You give back to your sport by taking it forward, by going and coaching the next generation. And, and again, I you know, I don't point the finger at anyone before I point it at myself. And you know, I point it at myself and say when I was, you know, stopped playing and started coaching, I thought, well, hey, I played college, I played pro. Why why would I need to take a coaching course? And then I did, and I was like, oh. That was really helpful, and, and, and you know, and part of part of the things that I really liked about it was, I saw things that the coaches that I liked were doing, and said, "Ah, that's what that's called, or that's what that is." And and so, yeah, it, it helped me helped me a ton. And I think my I'm always been pretty open to education, but I think a lot of people aren't. And so, if we open that door, that hey, you know what, this is actually worthwhile. You can get some good stuff from this. When people, you know, are 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, uh, I think then they come back at 24 and go, you know, I took some coaching education and it was good. Let me take another course. And especially if they have that propensity for it, right? It's going to click with the right people. You know, if, if you expose everybody, you know, the, the right 10 people or whatever are going to pick it up and, and want to pursue that further. What are the fundamental principles or values that should drive youth sports in the United States? Um, hmm. I mean, I, I think number one, it has to be child-centered or learner-centered, right? So our programming should be based upon the needs and the values and the priorities of the participants, not the people who are running it, right? So that's number one. Number two, creating people who are active for life. So creating experiences that make people stick with sport because of all the, on a national level, the the financial savings that come from having an active, healthier population. Um, at, you know, and then number three, I think sports skills become life skills, right? The, the same thing that you learn from sports, <clears throat> these things apply to someone who is a CEO of a company, you know, it's the things that they're looking for and the people that they're about to hire, right? Do you Can you plan your time? Can you deal with adversity? Can you work well with others? Um, do you treat people with respect? All these things that we might call character that sports can develop when done intentionally, these are things that apply for the rest of your life. <clears throat> and even if you are an incredible athlete and you actually get to make a living for a while playing a sport, you're still going to have two-thirds of your life when you're done playing your sport when these skills matter. So when we ignore them in sport, um, in kids' sports, which we do see often, right? We teach kids to cheat. We teach kids to cut corners. We we, we focus only on outcomes. We, we disrespect officials. Whatever that is, you're, you're not equipping them with the skills that they're going to need for most of their life outside of sport. In my uh, humble opinion. <laughs> no, I think in your well-established and qualified opinion. What can parents do now? If, if you're a parent of a 5- to 10-year-old kid or even, a, a, even an older kid who's in a youth sports program that it has or exhibits some of the problems that we're talking about, what can you do to kind of take charge and, and put your kid on a better path? 
Well, let's start in the beginning and say when you have a young kid, that's the easiest time to sample sports, right? <clears throat> so signing up for a season of soccer and a season of, I mean, like gymnastics and tumbling and martial arts are wonderful for body awareness for really young kids. You know, whether it's baseball, basketball, t-ball, you know, whatever, just sample those sports when they're when they're young, right? Then as they you know, get older, you know, try to find organizations that really, you know, have a, you know, clear mission statement and core values that they are teaching and that they're holding coaches and parents accountable to. And if you're part of an organization that's not doing that, I think you first you start to change it, you know, be like, hey, you know what, there's good information out there, not just like changing the game project or your podcast or the our way of champions podcast but you got the positive coaching alliance you've got proactive coaching you've got great nays you've got great organizations out there that provide resources of what quality programming looks like so you know go there and 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 if you don't see your program doing it be part of the change run for the board you know try to make a difference in your community um, before you turn and and have to leave well, and I think the there is a deep and altruistic willingness among uh, sport coaches in any sport who are doing it right to share that information. There are no trade secrets in sports anymore or in athletic development at all. Like everybody pretty much knows the same information. Um, but if you have somebody, if you find somebody who's maybe not in your area or is coaching a rival program or whatever that you see them doing it right, pick their brains, you know, go ask them questions, send them an email, take them out for coffee and find out what they're doing and how they're doing. And I, I can guarantee you almost a hundred percent of the time you're going to get an outpouring of more information than you could ever possibly process. One of the things that really blew me away when I went to my uh, USA track and field cert was that the guys who were teaching the certification that weekend wanted to give us everything. Like any question we asked, they were like, oh, here's my slideshow that I gave or my, my brief or my talk that I gave. Here's half of my collegiate curriculum that I teach at Ball State. I'm just going to give it to you because I want you to be the best coach you can be. And that's mm -hmm. Most of the people that I've met in this industry are like that. We want to make all the coaches better because it's not a zero-sum game. The better we all get, rising tide lifts all ships. Yeah, and I and I think also what we can do as coaches is realize that, you know, if you can spell Google, you can get a lot of your training plans, right? You can get a lot of your practices. But, you know, there's a great value to finding mentors in coaching if you're a young coach or just finding a you know a mastermind group of coaches who are not in your sport because if you're the track guy and I'm the soccer guy and we get a basketball person and a lacrosse person then we sit down and we meet in the middle and we talk about really what's coaching which is inspiring and motivating and communicating and all these things that have nothing to do with your sport and I think that takes the ego out of the room right when you when it's a bunch of soccer people together there's always like this ego of well who knows more and well let's argue about the nuances of our sport but when we meet in the middle and we can all agree that you're the track expert um, let's talk about the things that we all deal with that are not sports specific and there's a great um, great deal to be learned when you do that the the fundamental fundamental nature of truth is that it applies to a variety of circumstances equally so 100%. If, we can, yeah. if we can come to those truths, then then uh, we're, we're more likely to get smarter. Real quick, let's talk about changing the game project. How did you uh, How did you end up starting that effort? Well, you know, I'd been in coaching for a while after I stopped playing. A high school coach, uh, a college coach at University of Vermont, a uh, youth coach, and um, yeah, you know, my kids were getting a little bit older. And so I was starting to look at stuff not just as a coach but as a dad and saying, oh, this is not really <clears throat> the gr a great environment. And so, uh, you know, I like to write and research. And so I, I ended up writing this book, Changing the Game, and then realizing that it's actually kind of – it's not super hard to write a book. It's really hard to get people to know that you wrote a book <laughs> and, and, and know about your book. And so – you know, my publisher was like, well, you should start a blog. And so I started a, a blog and then the blog really kind of took off. And I think, you know, part of it was <clears throat> that because I, you know, maybe I had formal training as a historian, I was like, oh, I'm not allowed to have an original idea. So <laughs> I have to back it up with research. And so but when we wrote about something, we'd say, and hey, here's the research or here's why we think this. 
And I think a lot of people resonated with that, right? It wasn't just some guy who woke up in the morning had an idea, like there's some thought to this. And and what we were able to create at Changing the Game Project, whether it was on our blog or now on the podcast or uh, on our Facebook page or Twitter, is a place where, that we, A, we were a trusted resource, right? That this is good information and it's been vetted. And, and B, that it's also a place for healthy, respectful discussion, right? If, if you disagree with what we say, by all means, you can state that, but you got to bring something to the table, right? You can't say you're wrong because that's not what my grandpappy taught me. Like, you got to bring some research that says why you disagree. And I think there's plenty of places in sport where, where people can have a healthy discussion, right? Is it practice or play that makes an athlete? Right? There's research that backs up both of those things. So we can have great discussions about that. And so, uh, you know, I think that's what's been great. And then obviously, we now have a speaking team. And, you know, we go out and we work with schools and sports clubs and sport governing bodies. And, you know, I, I think what we found is this niche to be a connector from the top to the community and, and how the top can help the community and how the community can help the top of sport. And, uh, yeah, it's it's growing, you know, really, really fast. And you know, obviously, I got to do a TED talk, and that's a whole another platform for ideas that opens you up to different people. And uh, it's also a great speaker demo video. So, um, you know, hey, this is what we do. If if you like us, great. If if not, that's not no problem. And the TED Talk is worth watching. I'd encourage anybody listening to this podcast to definitely go Google John O'Sullivan TED Talk. Um, it, it'll cover a lot of the same ground we covered here, but uh, with much less interruption from silly questions from me. Uh, John, this has been fantastic. Uh, the website is changingthegameproject.com. John is working to give youth sports back to youth, and by that, maybe change the game, maybe change the culture, and maybe we aren't all dying of obesity in 20 or 30 years. Thank you so much for your time, John. Where else can people find you online? Uh, you know, our Twitter is at CTG Project HQ. Someone else stole CTG Project, so I had to add the HQ to it. Um, you know, Facebook, just look for Change the Game Project. And if people want to reach out directly to me, they heard me on here, you can just email me, John, J O H N, at changingthegameproject.com. And, you know, on our website, there's our, our podcast, which is called The Way of Champions, which is on iTunes and Google Play and SoundCloud and all those other fun places. Great. So if you like what you heard here, folks, go check out the uh, go check out his podcast as well. John, thank you again. This has been hugely informative, and uh, I can't wait to see what your projects yield in the future. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. We'll talk again. <laughs>